Welcome everyone, my name is Amy McDonald, the director of this joint, and thanks for coming out in the rain and Hurricane Lee. When Sarah O'Brien, the senior director of uh, community engagement, I think I got, may, may have, all right, good enough, at BLO, we were uh, brainstorming last year about possible collaborations that we could do here at City Space. And the minute she talked about their reimagining a Madama butterfly without uh, and addressing the racial stereotypes and the misogyny that are known with the opera, I just thought immediate, we both agreed, a behind the scenes conversation about how this production came to, came to light would be fascinating. And we're so lucky to hear about this journey tonight with our uh, WBUR senior arts reporter, Cristela Guerra, who is actually taking time from her Neiman Fellowship this year. Congratulations, once again, Cristela, who will be moderating the conversation. And yes, there is a reason there's a piano on the stage. We're gonna be uh, blessed to hear two arias from the opera tonight from the gorgeous soprano. Um, we'll be taking your questions throughout the hour. Just go to your phone, slido.com, and type in hashtag opera. And before um, we bring out the talent, I want to introduce the CEO and the general director, opposite general director and CEO of BLO, Bradley Vernatter, to tell you more about the production. Thank you, Amy, and to your team for hosting us here at City Space. It's a pleasure to be back again, and thank you all to all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, Boston Lyric Opera's production of Madame, But Madame Butterfly began several years ago, and the pandemic made that uh, made, made made us pause for a minute. And as we began reconsidering and and becoming ready to present live opera again and thinking about this production we hit the pause button one more time to reevaluate and reflect on this work in particular the ways that this piece impacts our artists our audiences our community and our neighbors and when i say the the impact and the legacy of this work what i mean is the way that it has been traditionally produced the way that um, it has been reflected on our stages, the artists who have been engaged in, on stage in, in these productions in, to portray these characters, and the individuals who are making key creative decisions about the storytelling and about the ways in which this piece is reflected in our communities. What followed from here was a year-long process that became known as the butterfly process, which is BLO's um, commitment to unpacking and examining the legacy of this opera and operas like this. In partnership with Phil Chan, who is the stage director for our production, and Nina Yoshida Nelson, who is a BLO artistic advisor, um, who you'll hear from this evening, um, alongside many scholars, community members, artists, um, the, a broad uh, spectrum of individuals, we curated and participated in a, in a, in a year-long discussion series. Um, and after that came to the conclusion that this work belongs in our art form, it belongs as a, as a, as a part of what we do. The lush music that Puccini has scored for us that has pierced our souls many times over um, deserves a place here and that there's a, a way in which we can present this in, in, in a way that represents and reflects our society today. Our production, which opens tomorrow, I'm very excited about this after all of these years of building towards this. Our production that opens tomorrow um, answers these questions and, and sets this in an entirely American setting, inspired by real people, real events in our shared American history, and is done so with an incredible, remarkable team of Asian and Asian American artists who are leading the, the storytelling. It's been a real pleasure to work with Phil and Nina, the entire creative team, with uh, our friend Karen, our soprano, who you'll hear from later, and Doug as well, who is our pianist. Um, and I I'm, I'm just can't express how, uh, how inspired and moved I am by all of the individuals, all of the contributions that have gone into this production, into this piece over the last three years, and, and the, the, all of the, 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 the 
excitement and energy and passion that has brought us to this moment today. So with that, please join me in welcoming Christella, Phil, and Nina. Thank you. How is everybody doing tonight? Did you brave the rain? Uh, is, is the mic on? Ooh, I think it's on now, yeah? Can we hear me? Yeah, I will project to the back of the room, I promise. This is about opera after all. That's right. um, I have a question. How many people happened to be at the dress rehearsal last night that I was at? Ooh. That's beautiful. Oh, it was, it was at the, uh, the, at the Emerson, at the at Emerson, Emerson Colonial. Yeah. yeah, the opening night is tomorrow. Who's going tomorrow? Lovely. All right. I, I, I'm so yeah, I Yeah, Karen, am, you have to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, most people know this. Um, I am not the kind to sort of talk at folks. I will open this up for questions very quickly. If you have questions, I want to hear them um, about the previous work, about this work. We just want to engage and interact. I think it's important to have conversations like this about art, especially because it took you so long to do this. Um, would you all kind of get into that with me? We talked before, but I'd love to hear sort of the origin story of how you decided to take on something this, this magnanimous, honestly. Yeah, I think it really started, um, and to give credit to, to Brad and the BLO team, um, you know, it, it, after going through COVID and, and looking at um, just how do we move forward with this work, you know, COVID was happening. BLO was trying to present this work for a couple years. They were also seeing the sort of rise in anti-Asian his social hysteria that's been happening the past couple years and just realizing that they weren't in a place to um, do this work with integrity when that was happening outside in our society. Um, so Brad reached out to me and said, you know, because of my background, um, I'm the co-founder of an organization called Final Bow for Yellowface, which has gotten ballet companies to rethink their depictions of Asians on stages, but also championing, hiring Asian artists to tell their stories instead. So um, Brad came to me and said, hey, like, let's talk about this work. How do we even begin to talk about this work? Let's, what, is, what is unpacking some of the issues around this piece even look like? Um, so, and that was really the birth of the butterfly process, which brought together scholars, historians, performers um, from across the opera ecosystem. I know, I, I, I get cranky too after, if I haven't had my nap. <laughs> I had a nap today because I knew you were coming. So, <laughs> um, but just bringing together leaders from across the field to really look at essentially like what's the problem with Madame Butterfly, but also more importantly, like how do we create a future for this work? How do we move forward for this work that's an important part of the opera ecosystem, yeah. um, especially as a work that brings in very important revenue for opera companies right now? You know, when we talk about commissioning new works by underrepresented voices, well, where does that money come from? Well, you know, Madame Butterfly, ticket sales. So we can't just cancel the work, um, but the traditional ways of doing it where we're pretending that we are Europeans from 100 years ago, that's not working with us as, as diverse Americans in the 21st century. You know, even for white Americans are not Europeans. So why are we pretending <coughs> that we're Europeans? So <coughs> how do we shift this work to be bigger, to be about us as Americans? And that was, you know, the, the root of the question around the butterfly process. Um, and then after that conversation, um, Brad almost casually said, hey, you know, like, <clears throat> what, what would you do with this story? You know, like, what, what would you do with this music? Um, and the rule was, you know, you can keep the music because that seems to be what was the good part about it. Um, but how do we find a congruent story that has the emotional impact that Puccini wanted, but that recenters us as Americans today, and it's not about, you know, oh, that's so sad that that Oriental gal kills herself at the end, but how do we make this story about us? And mm -hmm. that was really the, the start of this investigation. Um, and I was just so honored to work with Nani Yoshida Nelson, um, who as a performer has sung over 200 performances of Suzuki. So she knows the emotional contours of this work inside and out. Um, I joke that like Butterfly is her nutcracker to me, you know, like she, she does it all the time. And, um, <coughs> So just working with her as the dramaturg and saying, how do we tell this story? What's another way to tell the story? Um, and I go back to sort of my creative North Star, which is asking the question, what else could it be, 
right? So like when we're all kids, we were used to playing make believe and pretend and, you know, simple things like rocks and, and you know, can, can just be whole worlds. And, and that's the same process that we have to do here in theater as well. So we have this music, we have this score. What's another way to do it? And I think that's where, you know, Nina really came in to find this, this new story that fit. That was going to be my question, Nina. How many times have you played this role? Yeah, around 200. Do you remember how you felt the first time? Yeah, um, actually, I I grew up in Southern California. Um, I'm Japanese American, but had you asked me um, before I was an opera singer how I identified, I would have never said that I identify as an Asian or Asian American person. I identify as Californian, as a daughter, you know, things like that. Um, and it wasn't until I started singing and started becoming pigeonholed into Madame Butterfly that I had to start thinking about what does it mean to be Japanese? I didn't know what that meant. And so it, it wasn't until people started identifying me based on the way I looked um, as, as someone who fit into this opera that I was like, okay, so, so what does it mean to be Japanese? And actually through this opera, I have learned a lot about, you know, where my great grandparents came from and, and, and their culture, but I'm fourth generation American. So I was so far removed from, from what it meant to be Japanese. And it's been, it's been a great learning experience for me over the past, you know, 15 years doing as so many performances of Butterfly, because I've learned a lot about, you know, Japanese culture, but it was never how I saw myself. So I was like, I have to bow. What, what does that mean? You know, I have to get down on my knees. How do you do that in a kimono? i I didn't know what it meant to be Japanese, so it was it was really interesting. Um, would you speak about um, what the conversation you had on Monday, and what you all talked about? Uh, it was it was Monday, right? The conversation with other oh yeah. Japanese Americans, yeah, specifically, yes. yeah. So um, after our our um, final dress rehearsal, there were several Japanese Americans who um, one of which came up to um, one of our our. BLO team members and and was crying and said, um, you know, I cried all the way through Act Two and Act Three, and thank you so much for telling our stories as Japanese Americans and thank you for doing it the right way, and like it just it was so meaningful to know as a Japanese American myself, it's been one of my worries. Like, let's make sure that that, that we're honoring my culture and my community as Japanese Americans and, and to, to hear that they felt that way was, was uh, pretty incredible. Um, it's uh, probably important to say I've not seen Madame Butterfly in its original form. So my first introduction <laughs> to this opera is this one. And that will be what's in my mind even I think if I see an original version because I, I wanted this to be the the, the staple. I wanted this to be the foundation upon I bi well, upon what I build my sort of experiences with opera. My first opera was La Boheme. It made me cry, um, and I didn't know why it made me cry. I found myself crying. That's what this art form does. I think I cover race and identity, and I use arts and culture as a way to get into issues that are complicated or difficult. Sort of the more complicated, the more I enjoy talking about it. If done in a way that's respectful, that's that's important. And I think this is one of the most important conversations we could be having. Um, a reaction I had you all asked was the, how Butterfly was an empowered character, um, how Butterfly was given agency despite tragedy, um, and the sort of hopefulness that she had despite the fact that she was sort of being led astray. Um, I thought maybe we could introduce the first aria, if you all would like. Sure. So this is. Uh our lovely friend Karen, who is our butterfly. Um, we were complete strangers like two weeks ago, and we've since become family in a way that only Asian people can. Um, but uh, she's an incredible performer. I really hope you can see her uh, in the, the title role. And she's singing uh, the aria from Act Two, where, uh, Un Bel D, where um, she, is, she is describing this vision of the man that she loves, the man that she's waiting for, who will return and solve all of her problems. Um, and just this ideal vision of what he looks like and how he'll approach her and, 
and how she'll react and how she'll feel and just all of the complex emotions. In our production, it takes on another layer as um, it's also a woman waiting for her beloved to come back safely from war. So um, again, just another layer to, um, to that. Uh, but Karen really does it lovely. And, and, and um, thank you, Doug, for accompanying her too. Doug Sumi on the piano. Thank you. Now imagine like a full evening of that, right? Like what a treat. <laughs> I was, it just takes my breath away every time, truly. 
Um, the audience questions are coming in, and I'd love to ask one of these actually, but I also saw you, sir, in the front first. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah. Did you play Suzuki in Japan? I've never played Suzuki in ah. Japan, no. No. Nope. Yeah, no, but it's it's very interesting the way butterflies done there versus here. Well, I, I think especially too, if you think about when you're in Asia, especially in a homogenous place like Japan, um, everybody's Japanese, right? So you have good guys who are Japanese, bad guys who are Japanese. You know, lots of variety of who is represented in media, in advertisements. Whereas as an Asian American living in the minority, like you might just get the exchange student, like that's your trope, or you get Connie Chung you know, or you get Long Duck Dong, right? Like that's, you get one and that's it. Um, and if you're Indian American, you might have to share with Chinese. You, you know, you, you might just get Apu from The Simpsons, you know, if you're South Asian. That's, whereas in India or in Asia, you know, all of the stories are centered about us. So again, that just shows us the importance of centering. Whose center is at the story? So if we're centering Europe and looking through a European lens at Japanese people and at Americans, frankly, because the opera is also about Americans. What if we shift that center to be from an American perspective? And so I think that's what we're trying to do with the difference between singing a role like Suzuki in Japan versus a role like Suzuki in the United States. And uh, adding to that, um, when I've been to Japan several times, I'm people don't think I'm Japanese in Japan. Whereas here in the United States, most people look at me and go, "Oh, she's Asian of, of some type." But in Japan, I say, "You know, I, I'm Japanese. My my last name's Yoshida," and they said, "What?" So, um, so it's a different different experience. Yeah. Uh, I love this question. How far did you push each other to reimagine Puccini? Was it scary? And it goes with my question about. You know, what did you consider that you then didn't go with? I think I think I had a little bit more openness coming to it because I had never performed Butterfly. I don't have the same emotional attachment to it, so I'm a little bit more willing to discard how we do things um, in order to reimagine them. Um, just even in this process with the performers, like there are no kimonos, there's no geishas in this production, but physically, like so many of our performers have had to like push against how the body tells you to react just because of how many other productions they've done. So physically changing that has also been like an artistic challenge. Um, but coming in, seeing the potential, I think um, being out of the center, being off center, that's where often you get innovation is when you're thinking, when you're outside of the norm. So I think that's what I brought to the table and having Nina as sort of the emotional guardrail of saying like, no, that's not what Butterfly is. Or th you lose the emotional impact if you do it that way. Or that character wouldn't s feel that way. Mm. Like that was a way for her to keep it so it wasn't just like, well, let's set it as the Flintstones. You know, like it just reimagines like something cr crazy off the wall. No, it had to still work as a story. So I think that's what I brought yeah, you brought with, definitely with a lot that. of creativity, and I kind of brought the, well, you know, that it does have to stay within these these uh, guard rails, and so I think we were a really great team because Phil pushed me to think outside of the box, and I kind of also made sure that we were we were on the right, right road together. Usually it was like, no, she can't kiss him there because she's about to sing this really important part, and like, <laughs> she can't have her mouth in his mouth in this part, <laughs> you know, so like, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or she can't like lean over holding the baby because she can't sing that while she's hunched over with the baby. Or the, Poor I mean, Karen. Yeah, yeah. Or at the beginning, it was even like, "Oh no, we can't, we can't do that yet because nobody knows that there is a child yet. So how do we solve that?" So there was, I mean, all the way through, we that were kind of pushing part. and and pulling each other as to how do we make this work. And like, what it actually looked like was like waking up in the morning. You know, I'm like about to go for a run and I get a text from Nina that's like does Sharpless know by bar 57 that he's coming back or like you know does how does that work and then so like on my run I'd be thinking about it and I call nine and she I'm, I'm getting the kids out the door the school bus is here can I call you in 10 minutes but I'm also thinking about what Suzuki would say and you know so it was like that like all summer like all months summer. Yeah. months of that um do you think the italian do you think this means this could it also mean that call me back i know you're in a meeting like yeah i think we spoke two weeks ago at this point and you were still i asked are, are there rewrites oh my god we changed the ending like two days ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um enjoy the show yeah come come see it <laughs> 
but that's part of the magic, right? And part of part of the freedom that we've had in 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 producing this mm -hmm. is that we we have been able to say, okay, this really works, or we we tried what we thought was going to work and it really didn't work. So we've been able to have some of that freedom to be like, well, let's try something else then. But also, like on that note, like again, to like give a shout out to BLO, like when Nine and I were first approached with this, of like hey, here's the creative reins, like, go take a risk, like, tell a story. We were like, yeah, okay, but what are the rules? And they're like, no, 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 like, just go, like, your idea's great, go run with it. And we were like, really? Like, oh, okay, this is who we want to work with. Yeah, sure, great, done. Oh, the set's going to look like this. Yeah, that looks lovely, great. All of a sudden, we were given a seat at the table. Yeah, to make it was these just decisions. And and as as artists of color, like just real talk, like that doesn't often happen, or it it's done in a way that feels performative, um, but doesn't actually support what the work has to be. Or you're led into thinking the work's going to be something, but then it ends up just not being what you wanted it to be because, you know, I don't know. It, but it, that just hasn't been that experience. But like we were walking into it like already being somewhat distrustful from previous mm. experiences and it's just been such um i don't know such a joy like it's been such a pleasure working with blo and and just um being supported in this process and to take a risk and um just to try doing something new and um i really i think it's paid off i think it's really beautiful i think we have a really beautiful show um but just that level of work and care has not always been afforded. So um, really hats off to the BLO staff for being so supportive. Um, yeah. Um, I ran outside at the end of it because I love, you know how you sort of, at a wedding you watch like the, 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 one, the person who's waiting, you watch that, their face versus maybe whoever's walking in. I wanted to see the reaction. I want to see the exuberance of people walking out of a show that they know they're gonna be discussing for the next few weeks. Because if art does its, its job, that's what it does. It makes you consider life. And people, I remember some woman, they, they, everybody was perplexed by something. The beginning or the end or the middle. And um, I can't say a lot because I don't wanna ruin it for you, but the, the questions that you'll have, I almost wish I could, I could be there and ask you when you see it, because it's different. Um, we have another question, and I've been encouraged to not take questions from you, but to do it on Slido. So, um, Slido, <laughs> you, you Slido, I'm not going to be calling on you. Um, when the music is performed, do the characters take on a sharper focus for you as you're reinterpreting Butterfly? Sure, um, I think so. I mean, Puccini has written everything into the score. Um, you know, if you, like, even to the point that we were trying to figure out when to turn off a light bulb, and it was just like, well, there's a boom, and you just turn off the light bulb. But everything, he's written all of these emotions, the same emotions that, that you would see if you're seeing, you know, a, a, a traditional butterfly, it's all written in there. And, and all you have to do is listen and pay attention and and then you know for me sitting there I, I feel it in my body of course this is what's supposed to happen here because it he did it's all in the music and i would ask even the moments that are without because i notice when the music would go away there were certain things done or said without music Absolutely. that were even more powerful because they were stated sort of in the clear. Absolutely, and that's something that we've talked a, a lot about is the silence and, and, and the stillness and how important that is in telling a story as well. Like, you have to have that silence and stillness in order to, to, to feel how uncomfortable things can be or to settle or whatever that is, but that's part of what creates the tension. Mm. Yeah, I think as a choreographer too, um, knowing what stillness and silence or finding that movement quality um, it's also, I think, different. You know, the, our act one is very different than traditional butterflies. The chorus is, um, there's a lot of storytelling happening, um, but also just the restraint in the second acts where it's, it is confined. You do need to find a stillness. You need to let the music breathe and tell the story. It doesn't need a lot of pyrotechnics. It just needs simplicity and elegance, and the music does the rest. So just finding that restraint um, and not give it too much of a heavy hand, too, I think is also comes from, from dance for me. Um, so, Nina, you, I think you both told me this. I didn't know that Puccini had rewritten this five times. So for the purist, this has been, 
you know, he himself changed it. Um, so, but so then I would ask, you know, knowing that I haven't watched an original Butterfly, how did that feel? Like now that you're reflecting on the original Butterfly, the, the sort of the, the, the parts that were, you know, to use the kids' language, cringe, yeah. you know, like what, you know, for those who don't know what's problematic, yeah. what was problematic about Butterfly? Yeah, so I mean, to answer a couple of your questions, um, first of all, just in general, what's problematic, I, I think, is just the disorienting view when somebody who is not, not from your perspective is telling your story, right? So an outsider depicting your culture. It's very disorienting, and it doesn't do us any favors with audience members, especially if those outsider stories reinforce a negative thing that you have to live with in the outside world. So it's one thing to watch a story about a 15-year-old Asian woman. Um, it's another thing to then leave the theater and live in a world where Asian women are seen as hypersexual, hypersubmissive. They're being pushed in front of subways. Um, they're being shot in at, at their work. It, it's just that's, that's how art informs how we see each other. Art is supposed to connect us with each other, build empathy. And so if we have a warped view of each other, we're not seeing each other cl clearly or, or very well. So um, that is, for me, the larger issue with what's problematic about Madame Butterfly. And that's why this recentering um, has been a reclaiming of the story, but also um, just a new way of, of telling that story. So again, I, I don't think it's super radical. I mean, if anyone has seen a Shakespearean play done outside of its traditional setting, that's normal. Um, in fact, if you've seen women on stage um, in a Shakespearean play, you are seeing something inherently radical because that was not allowed. That was not a thing. So if you really believe that art has to be done the way it was done when it first premiered, then boy, I think Shakespeare would not have had the long shelf life that he has. Because the reason Shakespeare works is because 400 years later, we are still finding ways to make it an accurate mirror of our condition as humans. And opera can be the same way. Music can be the same way, you know, especially if it's, if it's good. Um, and I like to think of a classic. You know, we talk about the canon. A classic is not just something that was good in the past. It's a tension between the past and the future. It's got to pull from both sides. It's got to be something that was good before and also has redeeming value or tells us about something about us in the future. Our kids will want to go see that, right? It's that push and pull that makes a classic. Or else it's just a piece that was really nice that we don't do anymore, right? Or a piece that we used to do but is sort of boring, right? We all know what those operas are, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't. <laughs> you want to you name them? Norma. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, sorry. Bless That's you. just me. That's just me. Sorry. It's not COVID, I promise. Some people like Norma in this audience. I'm sorry. It's just me. This guy in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Nina? I, I love all opera. Well, uh, we were telling a funny story earlier today that when I first became an opera singer, um, you asked me like how I how uh, how I felt about opera when I first became an opera singer. I went to school right across the street at BU, and I remember um, my voice teacher saying, "Well, you should really be an opera singer." And I was like, "Opera is so over the top, and <laughs> oh my goodness, it's so dramatic." Yeah, but have you met you, Nina? <laughs> I'm a laid back girl from Southern California. <laughs> and I was like, that's not me. And what I've realized and what I've come to learn is that when I do love opera, it's when we're telling these real human stories and we're telling it in a way that we all identify. And I think that is when, when it becomes magical. You all are asking better questions than me. Well done. Well done. Um, as someone who is not sure how many times I'm gonna be on this stage over the next nine months, it's really, thank you for engaging with us. Um, how do you know when you have the right ending? Oh, you know, yeah, I don't know. In life as well as on stage, right? How do you know when you have a good <laughs> ending? Um, we knew when it was wrong. We knew, yeah, that, that's a good place to start. We knew when it wasn't working. Um, I think that, that you need to step away from the stagecraft and let the story speak at the end mm -hmm. to have the emotional impact. So less is more. The simple solution is always the best solution, is the most elegant solution. So we actually fortunately had um, 
some challenges with so, you know our set is just so big and beautiful that it takes place it takes a lot of stage backstage so it's sort of like tetris backstage at all times and we were like you know what this is just messy it's complicated the crew is messing this up the timing isn't great you know we just have to change we just need to like let go of this idea and try something new and that's part of the beauty of live performance and and you know once you finish a painting it's done but we get to keep chewing on it and you know we had our final dress rehearsal last night and then like pages of notes to all the singers i'm sorry karen you were great um <laughs> but just like hey here's a moment of of you know chew on this or whatever i on the first day of the process with the singers i talked about um it's like we're rock climbing together and you think of rock climbing as a solitary solo sport but it's not there's someone holding the rope so it's my job to hold the rope and say, okay, from my perspective back here, I see that you can put your left arm here and put your weight on there and your right arm, swing that around, but also to be there when they fall. If they take a big risk and they, they slip, I'm there with the rope, right? So that was the, the creative process in order to get them to, to a place where they could take some risks to tell a new story, to deal with something that was emotionally very hard, um, to get an audience to feel something too, to get an audience triggered by by something, the music or how they were they're expressing themselves, um, and that's mm. that's part of the process that I think is um, really magical about opera. It's like you're not just singing a song, you're not just telling a story. This music cuts through a lot of our walls as people and gets right to the emotions, and in a way that like, I guess I feel this in dance too. Sometimes like you have feelings that are just you can't put into words because they're just so big um and so sometimes no words in the case of dance or music in the case of opera um is the only way to express it so yeah i think that you know a story like butterfly um it's it's deep and the, the music certainly does help um you all probably can tell i am tiptoeing around what i can and cannot say because i really want you to experience this for yourself um and so if i achieve that um then I did my job. But would you all be open to talking about either the dreamscape or the photographs? Yeah, so, um, and maybe this, you, you wanna talk about this since this is your, your baby. <laughs> um, one of the things we talk about a lot um, when we're telling these racially specific stories is oftentimes they focus on the trauma of, um, of uh, identities and cultures. And one of the things we wanted to do is is share that the Japanese American community is a whole lot more than the trauma that um, that we went through in World War II. And so as we were looking at how do we do that, how do we also show, you know, the joy and even just the everyday life of what it's like to be Japanese American, um, we came up with this idea um, to, I think it was Bill's idea, to, to reach out to the, the Japanese American community here in Boston and ask people to submit their family photos um, to be part of our production. And so in this dream, we see um, Butterfly fall asleep and dream about her future and her past. And you see all of these incredible family photos from, from Japanese Americans here in Boston. And it's just the most moving with the music. There's no singing, it's just the orchestra. And you see, you know, photo after photo come up and, and, at, you know, last night I, I saw a, one of my family photos and it just, it like, it was really, really powerful. And um, I wasn't, you know, everyone else is like, okay, it will be, but like actually seeing it and just sitting back and, and realizing what it meant to see that part of the story on stage, it, it was really powerful. And I don't think Puccini could do that right he couldn't have done that and and i think that's where from where we're sitting now in the 21st century um we can do it that way so why not if it tells a better story um, especially a story that is as important as this one um you know the second half of the opera takes place in incarceration camp i'm i'm not japanese i'm chinese um my family was not incarcerated but i do feel like um, we can't just wait for japanese americans to tell this story um, otherwise, Japanese American artists like, well, what if they want to tell jokes? Why? Why does that burden have to fall on them to repeat the story? So, as an American, um, I think it's all of our responsibilities to keep this part of our history alive, um, so that we don't repeat it. So, whether we're talking about the Holocaust or Japanese American incarceration, like, it that's all of our stories, and, it, and it's something that we all have to 
look at with clear eyes. And so this was one way to keep that story alive. Um, you get Puccini, but you also get to see, um, you know, a, a part of our, st our story, all of our story, you know, not just for their story as Japanese Americans, but our story as collective Americans. So, um, yeah. The emphasis on being all American, I kept noting that whenever she would say my all American house, an all American meal, what does it mean to be American? And I feel like that is sort of in the eye of the beholder and it can be whoever is sort of here, you know? Um, audience question, why do you think it's so infrequent that works like Madame, Madame Butterfly get a fresh take? I think especially for Madame Butterfly, there's such, um, it's hard to reimagine the Orientalist repertory in opera and ballet, I've noticed, because we love the spectacle, right? It's usually the most beautiful music. It's usually like the most opulent sets. And it's like, we love just watching those kimonos and the sakura blossoms. Like, we love it, right? It's beautiful. And it's also problematic, but it's just really hard to divorce those two things. Can something be both beautiful and problematic at the same time? We're not good with living with that tension. Um, so it's better to just say, well, it's beautiful. And if you have a problem with it too bad, you know, with, because we're not comfortable, it's not comfortable for us to say, wow, that is a beautiful production. And the yellow face was really racist, mm -hmm. right? It can be both of those things at the same time. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we reimagine magic flute and Bohem and all these other operas. Um, and we're very comfortable with that, but you know, the stories that take place in Asia in this fantasy orient, it's such a strong imaginary kingdom in our collective imagination. And you look at Orientalism in visual arts and all these other forms, it's, it's a powerful perfume, mm -hmm. you know, and we can't, it's really hard to imagine another way to do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I think a work like Butterfly has that is one of those works and it has emotional appeal that people are like, well, I grew up watching it or, you know, I have a specific relationship with this music and I don't want to see it done in any other way. Um, another thing maybe with butterflies, it feels like almost like a true story because it's based on historical facts. There are many elements of butterfly that did happen, but it's not a true story in the same way that like an opera about a specific person, a historical figure is a true story, but it feels like a true story. So that's why maybe we're less hesitant to mess with it because it feels like that's a real person's story when it's not. It was a French lieutenant's sort of dirty rag magazine smut book turned into a play by an American, turned into an opera by an Italian, now done by a bunch of Asian Americans here in Boston, right? We're like looking through <laughs> a few different lenses here, guys, you know? So what what is even this work at this point? So, yeah. Um, I'll... Uh... I, we, I was thinking about this. I'll offer a trigger warning just for sort of violence. Um, the idea of death in this play, um, at a time of movements like Stop Asian Hate, uh, the amount of violence specifically against um, Asian Americans and Asian women specifically, um, how is that, how does that move at a moment like this, especially following uh, the amount of stereotypes and tropes, even that came out during the pandemic? Yeah, I don't know. Just thinking a lot about working in the arts right now. Um, I'd had a premiere at Oakland Ballet um, last year, and it's right next door to, it was at the Asian Oakland Asian Cultural Center. It was right next to the dim sum restaurant that my family, I grew up going to like every weekend, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like every weekend with my family. And my dance performer, I had a premiere on the program, and my dad was too scared to go. He's like, I don't feel safe. I don't want to park in that neighborhood. I don't feel safe going to the theater. It's like, you don't even want to see the work. Like they can't even see the work, not because they don't know about it or because they can't afford it. They're just literally too scared to leave the house, let alone go experience a work like a, a full opera or something. So that was weighing heavily on my mind as we're doing this, this work. Um, so thinking about death, thinking about the end of this opera, um, again, going back to that question of what else could it be, right? There's a literal death where somebody dies, where somebody decides to, to commit suicide. And what that means in our society now means something different than it did in Puccini's time, um, which me meant something different about, you know, in Japanese culture that Puccini was trying to portray, right? It's a few different layers of difference, but ultimately 
what is death? What is a death? Is it possible to experience death but remain alive? I mean, how many people do you know who are dead, who are still physically alive but might be dead inside? What does that look like? Is that death? So just what else could it be? What are other ways that, that this story could still have a tragedy but not be a graphic Asian woman who gets slashed at the end, which is what we have to deal with when we leave the theater already? But is there another death that maybe we all can identify with or feel, be moved by, that hits a little closer to home? And again, that's part of recentering, right? So that it's not just, oh, that's that poor Oriental gal at the end, she killed herself, right? It's about, no, I, I've experienced this death. This, this has touched me. It's my story, right? And that's what, that's what good art does. And that's what opera can do. Do you all want to give context to the next aria? Yes. Karen, <laughs> welcome back. Um, this is uh, her aria at the end of the opera. Um, so no spoiler alerts, but basically um, she is singing to her child. Um, and she's saying goodbye to her child. Um, she's making a huge sacrifice, um, a sacrifice that only a mother can give to make sure that that her child... I don't know, has a future. And so this is uh, just a portrait of a mother's heart being broken um, at the end of the opera. Your face is devastating, <laughs> truly. I, I, even last night, I remember just watching, and the universal truths throughout this are so present, but the way that you emote, I don't have to read anything. And I, I yeah, my heart breaks, and it broke last night too. Um, we only have a few minutes, so if you have other questions, please get them in. Uh, Interesting. So we asked this earlier, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to asking it again. If, were there parts of Butterfly that you were that you saw as off limits? I don't think you saw any parts off limits. I think from the very beginning, we all decided that that 
the the main arias and the main trios and and things that that are so well known mm. um by uh, opera lovers were were off limits as far as making any changes in any words or i'd say the music in general well, the not music, just the aria absolutely. like we haven't but, cut yeah. a single note in the yeah. opera i mean really that was the challenge, mm -hmm. right? It was like the rule of the game is here's a bunch of dots and on squiggles in this little book <laughs> and you can't change any of those, but how you bring that to life, that's where there's room for interpretation. Yeah. And especially like in her, in her Unbeldi aria, we are like, okay, well here we are in the middle of the desert and how, how do we make that work without making any changes where she's talking about, you know, the, the harbor and the ship. And, and so it, it made it, m made us have to be more creative about the way we were thinking about what else it could be. Um, interesting. Did you speak to individuals who were interned during World War II? Um, we worked with um, some amazing Japanese American historians um, to really guide us, not just, um, around the laws, but also like costumes. What was it like? What was it really like? Um, just picking out little details like, well, w multiple families would have been in one barracks and how they um, separated their families was literally just a sheet on a string that would just tie your section off from the next family over. Um, asking them what kind of things would have been in camp. You know, the flower duet is one of the most beautiful you know, parts for, for these, for two female singers, you know, but they're in a desert. How do we bring flowers into this space? What could be, what else could it be? You know, and, and just starting with those, some of those, again, historical guidelines of saying, okay, these are the rules, right? You can't just give them things in camp that aren't there. You can't introduce fantasy elements. It has to be informed by a real, a real story, real constraints. So that's, that was, Mm -hmm. almost the fun challenge of like, you know, it has to be within these rules. So it really wasn't as loosey goosey in terms of, oh, free imagination. There's actually quite a lot of constraints that we put on ourselves to make it so that the work made emotional sense and historical sense. Um, you know, Puccini wrote this opera over a hundred years ago and we've since had a hundred plus years of cultural baggage with Japan, right? The biggest defining moment for Japan and, and us from where we're sitting is not the opening of, of Japan and Commodore Perry, right? And the Meiji Restoration, right? That's not, that doesn't mean anything to us today. And so this reimagining was f making that feel urgent, mm -hmm. uh, making this music feel urgent and relevant to us. Anna, will you speak to what you told me about uh, a way forward for problematic pieces? You know, there are people who would just say, let's just Sorry. Um, there are people who would cancel it. I think there are people who would not take three years and reimagine an entire opera. Um, there are people who would throw this away. Right. And I think that we can't do that. You know, part of part of part of opera is is hundreds of years old. But if it doesn't make sense now, how are we going to get audiences to come see it? It can't just be because we've always seen it this that way that this is the way it goes forward. So like you know, Phil and I spent a lot of time. How do we move this forward without canceling it? Because also another thing about Madame Butterfly for Asian artists is it's our foot in the door. So if we're just canceling Butterfly, our work is all gone. Our faces are erased from the stage. So what can we do to not only, you know, to, to respect our artists, but also our communities? And how can we look at bringing people who have, you know, maybe a lot of people think, oh, opera is not for me, you know, it's for, for rich white people or whatever. How can we bring people who have not felt comfortable in the past into our theaters and, and, and make this, uh, this art about everybody? So everybody feels welcome and everybody wants to come. And I think that's, that's something that we're all kind of trying to figure out in opera, but the way forward is by, is by reimagining and, and making it relevant for, for today. I also, um, as a choreographer, I like pushing the boundary forward. I like looking forward. I think artists who are living today, we have to look forward. Um, but if you don't know where you've come from, 
how do you know what direction you're going? Mm -hmm. We, you need to understand the past as a scholar and as a performer. You need to have sung these songs in your body, you know, do these dances in your body, um, because then how do you know what's already been done? What's cliche? You know, you you can't be avant garde. You can't push the boundary forward. You can't innovate unless you know what the roadmap of the past is. And some of these works, you do need to see them. You need to, to have them in your body. You need to experience them. Um, but there's just other ways of doing it that work for today. I mean, you know, we have projections now. We have, we have cameras. We have all different ways of sharing content and telling stories. You know, our, our storytelling should include all of that. And I think BLO is really trying to find that balance between new work that is of this moment. We are all living people. We deserve to have a voice in in making our mark in history, right? Like our lived experience today is us as a room full of living people. We deserve to have art that is made while we are alive that reflects this time, right? But also we need works from the past that can also show us who we are today. And so it's finding that balance um, and that opera, this like art form from the courts of Europe from hundreds of years ago can be something that can be urgent and touch each other and, and see each other better with more empathy. That's, um, I don't know. I think that's why we still have a future for opera, you know, if we want it. I love this question. Well done, truly. Do you feel closer to Puccini now or perhaps more angry? I feel closer to Nina, <laughs> <laughs> which is always great. I highly recommend the experience. Um, <laughs> But I don't know, I, 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 it's maybe this is ruined opera for me. Mm. Um, as a dancer, I can't walk into a ballet performance without either knowing someone in the cast or having done it before, or like I'm watching, I'm like, oops, she almost slipped out of that turn. Oops, she didn't breathe in the right spot. Oops, he's late on that, you know, like I just can't relax. And opera has been such a place for me because like I'm not a singer. I don't know how Karen does that. Those two little, little wobbly things in her throat can fill a whole room like I don't know and make and make me cry like I don't know how that works like I'm just mystified but now sort of like being in it and it's like oh all of the clues like the music is just so clear like every composer you're like I'm now listening to it differently about like what am I supposed to feel what am I supposed to think what am I it's all there at least all the good ones it's all written there and so I'm listening um, differently, but I think this has like absolutely ruined opera for me because like now I, now I'm only watching it as like, oh yeah, oh she was she was okay there, oh she was flat, oh I wouldn't have staged it that way, you know, so yeah, totally ruined, but ruined ruined in the best possible way, spoiled perhaps. Thank you, Biello. <laughs> yeah, I've I've often been thinking about how do I go back to doing a traditional butterfly, um, and and what will that be like for me as a performer. And I'm not sure, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing one in, in January, so you'll have to write me and ask. Um, but, but I think that, that there's a lot to be said for, for telling a story that I really relate with and, and for feeling that through the music. And, you know, for so many years, it's been about feeling these emotions through the music um, for me. And I just have everything so, like I feel it in my breath and in my body. Through, through Butterfly, but, but now feeling it also in a way that I identify with the story, um, I think it'll probably be a little empty the next time I do a, a traditional butterfly, but maybe not. Will you do it again? Will we reimagine another opera, perhaps? Yes, you'll, please. You'll have to ask the BLO team. <laughs> I don't know if they'll have me back. <laughs> Everyone, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you both, truly. Thank you for coming. Nina, where are you performing in January? Okay. And where is that? North or South? North okay. Carolina. North Carolina. Right, yeah. uh, I don't know. I don't have my okay. flight yet. So um, <laughs> and that's the diva answer, right? <laughs> Someone else has booked my flight. I don't know where I'm going. Absolutely. Uh, Phil, I think you've got a career as a stand up comic as well. Um, this was so wonderful. I'm going to the matinee on Sunday. 
it runs through Sunday, October 24th. I know that you're all going to want to see this. Next up in this room, um, we have a few things, but I think for this crowd, we're partnering with Boston Fashion Week on October 2nd and October 2nd, 6th. A conversation about sustainable fashion on Monday. There will be a fashion show and a moth style glam slam storytelling on October 6th. Find tickets at wbr.org slash events to get the latest info on that and everything that's happening here at WBR City Space. Sign up for our newsletter. Just click on the QR code right behind the screen. This is my duty to let you know about this at the end. Another round of applause. This was a great conversation. Thank you, BLO.